Well, welcome once again to Heartbreak, everyone. Uh, before we start, just a couple short announcements. First of all, we want to mention that today's program is made possible by the Mich Michigan Council for the Humanities, and uh, thank them for that. And also that next week's art break will be a virtual art break, in other words, no in-house sessions. And that's going to be the uh, catalog launch for the Unmasking Masculinity exhibit. So again, uh, no in-house art break uh, next week. Well, I think for all of us that had at one time or another an artist that we find some special personal meaning. Um, in many cases, it's uh, uh, an artist that might bring something into focus that's been in the back of our mind and suddenly we're sort of seeing it more clearly. Or uh, an artist who really invites us to look at the world in a different way and uh, we go along, um, go along with that. Well. For our guest today, uh, Paul Solomon, uh, one such artist, is the painter Robert Colescott. And uh, Robert Colescott is a, is a challenging artist to engage with. Um, he's confrontational, he's controversial, but he's also very compelling. And I think he's uh, exactly the kind of artist that benefits from a personal appreciation that we're going to uh, have today. And I think uh, Paul is really an ideal guide for this. Uh, he's professor of art at the uh, uh, WMU's uh, Frostick School of Art, where he is the director and lead teacher for the uh, interdisciplinary program, Direct Encounters with the Arts. Uh, but beyond that, Paul is really the consummate educator. Uh, he's not only a dedicated and inspiring teacher, but he's passionate about developing new ways of teaching and learning, and he has created uh, several classes and programs that uh, have been award-winning. In recent years, he's broadened his focus to a more cross-disciplinary approach to uh, teaching, focusing on the connections between art, science, and medicine. And he developed a class called the Skilled Observer in Art and Science, which he teaches at the uh, Stryker uh, School of Medicine to uh, fourth year medical students and also for undergraduates uh, at WMU. And finally, he's going to have a, a book coming out. It's an interactive textbook called Inventing the World, How Art Creates Reality, which is designed to be used in a variety of humanities and uh, art courses. But today we'll get his thoughts on Robert Colescott and his book from Paul Sullivan. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Greg, for that generous introduction. Um, thank you all for coming and coming here to celebrate my birthday with me today because <laughs> it's, it's really lovely. Um, I want to first say that um, the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts has been an integral part of my being here in Kalamazoo these 20 plus years, uh, more like 25 years. Um, I've brought, I don't know how many thousands upon thousands, um, actually by this time, tens of thousands of students who are brought here to, uh, to the Calvin Institute of Art. And it's particularly uh, thrilling uh, since Belinda Tate arrived um, because she and Rahima Barber have created a new museum, really. Of course, it's a continuation of a museum that was always here, but with a new vision and a new um, the scope has been broadened and um, we learn many profound uh, lessons through the exhibitions and programming that the Council of of Arts does here. So I thank uh, Belinda and Raheem and I thank uh, Shannon and Miriam and other staff. Thank you, Greg, uh, here at the KA. Um, give you a little background on this um, presentation. Um, the past two years, I've been living in New York City, which I've, I've lived many years in the past. I went back so I could be near my mother, uh, who, God willing, will be 96 in January. And um, while I was in New York, just this past summer, I saw an announcement that the new museum, which is down the Bowery, was putting up a, a retrospective of Robert Colescott's work. The only thing I knew about Robert Colescott 
at that moment was one his an iconic painting of his which we'll come to soon and i thought wow i need to know more about this guy and i went down there and um visited the exhibition and it was um i don't know i think just a week later that uh rahima and shannon and i were, were on a phone call talking about the coming semester that i'd be back here and i'd be bringing students here again and uh, meanwhile, Rahima asked me, would I be interested in, in writing an essay for the exhibition catalog for unmasking masculinity for the 21st century? And um, I said, yes. <laughs> and um, I ended up writing a 2000 word essay, which, you know, relative to completing a book, which I'm turning in the final revision on the chapters uh, two days from now, 2000 words isn't a lot, but I really didn't know who Robert Colescott was, and I didn't know what I was going to say about him. And uh, anyway, I spent about 120 hours writing the 2,000 words, you know, including time for research. And it was just an illuminating, thrilling experience to kind of try to begin to live within his shoes and, and see what he saw. And I hope that will come through um, in this talk. Uh, I think probably would be a good time to dim the lights. So I titled it, um, my, my title for the exhibition essay, the, the catalog essay is um, The Legacy of Robert Colescott's Manhood. But um, Rahima and my dear friend, Carl Brown, who's here, thank you for being here, Carl. Both of them encouraged me as we talked about it to go ahead and, and speak about it in a very personal voice. And so that's why it's called Masked Up, Robert Colescott and Me. And hopefully it will make sense as we go along as to why I say and me. And I think the masking up will come to be evident as well. Uh, on the left is a detail of one of Colescott's paintings. It's a painting called Beauty is in the Eye of the Beholder. I like this photograph because it's one thing to have a digital copy of an image that you download or someone gives you. This is actually a picture I took with my iPhone. And in fact, if you look in the lower left corner, you can see the edge of the frame. So it's it's in a different perspective, kind of at an angle, where I took it in such a way that I felt like Colescott, that's a self-portrait, is kind of looking directly at me or at, at us, the viewers. Um, on the right is a picture that I didn't even know I had until very recently. Uh, it was kind of a a photo, it was a photograph of my father when he was in, in his 20s um, working as an artist. Um, what I, where I want to start is, is to say that Robert Colescott, or many, many contemporary artists owe an incredible debt to Colescott. I think we all do. And honestly, it's a travesty that Colescott is so little known. As Greg, you know, intimated, you know, his work can be really challenging to look at, discomforting, uncomfortable. It is provocative. Um, and there are many artists who specifically have talked about their how they were influenced by Robert Colescott. Kehinda Wiley is one. And of course, this is the painting that, that we have in, in this beautiful exhibition here, Unmasking Masculinity. Um, and you may know um, Wiley for his portrait of President Obama, and you may know him for and this is appropriate, uh, relates to Colescott's work, in that Wiley often has appropriated images from past art history. So this is his exceptional, massive painting. It's like, I don't know, 18 feet high um, from 2005, Napoleon leading the army over the Alps, which of course was uh, based upon this uh, Jacques-Louis David uh, painting uh, in, the, in the early Romantic era. And you'll see how uh, Colescott modeled for Wiley and other artists this practice of revisiting very iconic Western European works of art to, to find new information with them, to, to look at them differently. Um, another artist who has acknowledged her debt to Colescott is Kara Walker, who is an amazing, uh, not only amazing artist, but, but the research she does in the history is stunning. Um, this is the work that first made her name uh, nationally known in, in the mid-90s. Uh, it's, it's a huge work um, that you know, you know, appropriates this 
technology that existed before photography of making silhouettes um, because before photography, unless you were rich, the only way you could get a little portrait done was to go to a studio where an artist would cast your shadow with a candle and then cut it out and there's your little silhouette, that's your portrait. Um, and Kara Walker, also I think borrowing from Cole Scott's example, has always been fearless in her depictions. So in these um, panoramic images of what it was like of life uh, during Civil War times and, and afterwards, you see scenes of, you know, a, a white uh, couple there on the left. Um, but then you also see dead center, this image of an enslaved woman filleting uh, a slave master in the center. Um, Kara Walker's work, uh, this one in 2014, this is my photograph of her work that was uh, temporarily displayed in, in um, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, one of the great works of art of the past 100 years, I would say. Um, and again, tremendous research involved in, she was given this space that used to be part of the Domino uh, Sugar Factory, where most of the sugar consumed in the United States was refined in that very spot on the, on the East River in Brooklyn. Um, so she was given temporary usage of that space because then it was turned into condos and, and a retail uh, location. And um, the work has an armature within it. However, there were 35 tons of sugar were used to create this um, extraordinary image. I'd love to spend more time on, on this work, but I, I'm gonna, I wanna get to Cole Scott soon. <laughs> um, and this is another artist uh, who many people see um, being influenced by Cole Scott's example. Uh, one of the things that interests me is that uh, Kerry James Marshall is on record as saying that it's very important for him to depict black people who look black, who, who have very dark skin. Um, and it, it works beautifully with his incredible palette of technicolor uh, pigments, which is also, a, I think, a tribute to Cole Scott's examples. So from there, we're going now to this iconic work. This is the painting that came to mind for me when I saw uh, that the new museum was mounting this huge retrospective, which by the way, was mounted first in, in Cincinnati, then came to Chicago and, and then came to New York. Uh, and it just closed recently in, in the beginning of October. Um, so at this moment, um, I'm gonna do this at least this one time. I'm, I'm going to ask, um, ask, for what, ask you what you see here. But before I do, let me just uh, refresh your memory of where this image came from. This is the traditional Washington Cross in the Delaware, because as far as we know, um, George Washington Carver was not on the boat uh, crossing the Delaware with George Washington. Um, so here's the painting. And just to make it a little easier to see details, here's a, a blow up of a good portion of it. So I'd like to, um, can a couple, a few people just quickly tell me something you see in this painting? Hang on, let me, let me uh, get close to you so you're picked up by the, the millions of people watching from- I just see stereotypes. see stereotypes. See stereotypes. Yeah. Anybody want to elaborate on that? More specific? about fishermen, um, how you feed your family. Okay. Yeah. What more does anyone say? Yes. I'm witnessing people who are making the best of the situation that they're in. Okay, thank you. Someone else want to speak here? This, their skin is black. Yeah. Their, their skin is black? Seems like a good observation. There's one woman. Oh, yeah. Only one woman. One woman. Uh -huh. Yeah. One of them is racing the American flag. Yeah. 
Indeed. Well, the difficulty of describing attests to the fact that Colescott's images are challenging to talk about. Um, but what we're seeing here, um, I was I was somewhat uh, anticipating that people might have pointed out certain figures that are recognizable. If you were all my students at age, and, and were only about 18 or 20, they wouldn't know, but there's this figure here. Does he look familiar to anyone? Uncle Ben? Uncle Ben, yeah, exactly. Oh. Um, and what about this woman here, the one woman? Yeah, precisely. Um, Cole Scott is, is throwing in our faces these extreme caricatures of black Americans, uh, often used to sell consumer products for decades and decades and decades, and um, also embracing every stereotype there is about why why people should think that black people are shiftless and you know, they will look, but you know, playing the banjo, smoking a cigar, um, drinking something out of this um, vessel here. And um, most notable, Aunt Jemima is sucking off this man here. So, welcome to the world of, of Robert Colescott. <laughs> um, this is a uh, a painting that says a lot about Cole Scott. Um, it's called White Boy. By the way, Cole Scott was born in 1925 and died in 2009. And I'm going to talk about his upbringing in, in a moment or two. Um, but in this painting, done while he was um, of, a, of a good age, it's self-portrait. We see him there with white, bluish hair, the top left, and his face, uh, kind of three-quarter turn, overlaps with the face of his mother. You know, we know enough to know that that's a depiction of his mother. Um, but interestingly, where his face and her face kind of collide or overlap, there's this black mask, and that's one of many reasons why I titled this program, you know, Masked Up, this masking. And the masking is uh, very appropriate because uh, Cole Scott, when he was a, a boy, he was his mother was very light skinned, his father was darker skinned, and his mother told him, you will pass as white. And he passed as white for 40 years. Um, and all of that plays out in this painting and in others. Um, in the center here, there are two little figures, a little tiny doll of a boy and a doll of a girl, both of which have pins or nails stuck in them, which is which references the, the voodoo culture of Louisiana, where uh, his parents grew up uh, and then they migrated to uh, to Oakland, California. Um, I think I have an enlargement of this part part of it so you can see it a little better. And while the, uh, the little boy, which I think definitely represents Colescott as a little boy, uh, he is not looking at the other little girl, little girl doll, but rather he is only has eyes really for what's going on here between this woman and this man. And then in the background, you know, my take on this interesting thing that Colescott has been so ignored that there really isn't a lot written about him yet. I think that's beginning to change just now. A big biography is um, here is going to come out in a couple of years. But the nice thing is it, it leaves someone like me who dives into his work really innocent of his of knowledge of him to begin with. I've just had to make my mind up myself about what, what, what these meanings are. So for me, that's image in the background. That's really the Garden of Eden. That that's those are the primordial couple, uh, Eve and Adam. And if you can see there, uh, they're separated by a little river. Uh, she is a statuesque black woman, and he is this 
very Caucasian European looking man with quite a heart on. Um, and I, th I think it's that erection that, that is gonna bridge the gap between the two of them across this river that divides them. That's my read on that. Um, this image uh, allows me to introduce uh, Colescott and his uh, story. So Colescott uh, parents, the, the title of the painting is 1919. If you look on the very bottom at the center, you see that the title is on the painting right between these kind of cotton candy clouds holding different objects that somehow symbolize uh, a life. And he's depicted his mother on the left and his father on the right. She was very fair skinned, fair skinned black woman. And his father was not nearly that dark, but I, I think Colescott was exaggerating their skin color to, to make a point about their lives. Um, his mother could pass as white and she brought, brought up her son, Robert, and his twin brother, Warrington Colescott, to be white. The father um, wanted to have a career as a jazz musician. He was very talented, but the doors were shut to him in, in Jim Crow America at that time. And he ended up um, becoming a Pullman porter, um, serving white people on trains. Uh, he also served uh, in the US Army in World War I in a quote, colored regiment. In 1919, they moved as part of the Great Migration when so many Black families, Black individuals from the South moved, moved to cities like Detroit, Chicago, Newark, New York, but also to California. And um, so Colescott creates this really very cheerful, wonderful map. And um, pretty much in the center, we have this nest and, and that represents him and his brother, you know, being nurtured by their parents. A much more cheerful image than really existed for him. Um, from everything I've read, uh, it was very stressful to be in this family where there were these deep secrets kept uh, in Jim Crow America at that time, you know, growing up in the, as a little boy in, in the uh, second half of the 1920s and then into the 1930s. Um, I, there are very few photographs that I've been able to find of Colescott. This is one, and it's I don't know how old he was at this point, but probably in, in his younger years. Um, he graduates high school, he volunteers and becomes, uh, in the end, he ends up becoming a tank, part of a, a regiment that he served as a tankman. Uh, and he was accepted in the regular army, meaning to say the US Army saw him as white and so they put him together with other white soldiers. Um, but of course he had this secret going with him wherever he went. Um, he fought briefly in the last weeks of the war in Europe, uh, was honorably discharged, and then uh, began to work at uh, his art, which was significant for him already. Uh, he attends both San Francisco State College and uh, UC Berkeley. Um, and then an amazing uh, thing happens is that uh, he gets the idea that he should go to Paris. I think all the soldiers, my father would tell me this, my father also fought in Europe actually for a longer time than, than Robert Colescott. And um, there was a sense of freedom there, social and political freedom. Um, and certainly for anyone who thought themselves as an outsider, uh, the culture of Paris and other European cities was much more welcoming than your average American city, that's for sure. And so, he goes to the atelier of uh, Fernand Leger. I'm going to show an image of that in a second. And quickly also, he marries his first of four wives. He actually got married five times because his third wife, he married twice. He married, divorced, and married her again. Um, busy guy. Um, he marries Zdenka Falarova, who was uh, Czechoslovakian and didn't speak English, but spoke French fluently, and Kolskot soon spoke fluent French as well. Uh, he also became very engaged in uh, French literature. Um, they go back to the United States. Well, he takes her to the United States. He gets his master's degree and his son is born. The first of, he ended up having four sons uh, mothered by three of his wives. This is, um, Cole Scott's work in which if you know Leger's work, you can see the, the echoes of Leger here. Uh, Cole Scott 
like a lot of American artists, young artists at that time, were was really interested in uh, non-objective and abstract art. But he's changed because Leger is much more interested in, in figurative work. You know, this is a an early Leger in the 1920s. Um, he comes back to the United States and begins to further experiment with, you know, searching for different styles. Um, but this is his beginning point with this painting in which he appropriates, I'm sure for many of you, you know that the, the Olympia of the Olympia was a truly iconic work by Edward Manet. This is Colescott's version of it. You know, this is the original. You know, this one was considered, you know, uh, it outraged this, the establishment art world of Paris because, really, because the woman has the temerity, of course, men I painted right, to look at the viewer. That, that was considered an outrage. Um, and this is Cole Scott's take on that painting. Um, and I'm not, this is going to be the last slide in which I'm going to kind of give you dates, but I just wanted you to have a, a, an idea of some of the steps he makes in, in, in the first half of his Half his, half his life. So because he, he becomes an art educator, as did my father. So both men fought in Europe. Both men wanted to be artists. Both men grew up in very challenging situations, which I'll elaborate about my family, my father later. Um, and he has another son. Um, he becomes an assistant professor up in Portland, Oregon, divorces his first wife, marries his second wife, has another son, promoted. Um, and the most important thing on the page really here is, in terms of his development as an artist is that he gets this artist residency in Egypt in uh, 1966. And this really changed his life and his work. So this is a work that he produced while in Egypt. You can see um, his color palette is vibrant. And it's very flat. He was influenced by looking at all the ancient Egyptian art, which is stunning, but very flat, has this flatness. Um, and he's on record of, of talking about that suddenly he was in this environment where there were people of every different shade, skin color, uh, there in North Africa. And he finally felt like he could relax and say, oh, I don't have to pass as white anymore. And by 1967, actually he leaves earlier than he wanted to, but the Six Day War had just broken out um, in the Middle East. And so the, the US Embassy said, you better get out of there. Um, and he publicly declares himself to be a black man and a black artist. And we see that emphatically in the work that comes. And he just dives in to, again, um, looking at the racist caricatures that are so common in American culture. So here we have um, Colonel Sanders, kind of this florid pink face and the white suit and the saddle shoes. And he is doing his best to get his way with this woman who's labeled as, uh, who we, we understand as Aunt Jemima. That, that's his title for the painting there. Um, and Colescott prints, you know, paints onto the surface, kind of captions, it's like a, a cartoon, uh, where she's saying, I can't dance, Colonel. And he says, don't hurt much. Of course, they're not talking about dancing, really. Uh, they're talking about more than that. Uh, and then the children, the one up top and left says, oh, that Colonel. The girl says, pancakes cold. So pancakes getting cold. And, uh, and the little boy just says, shit. Kind of, that, that kind of sums it up nicely. <laughs> and, you know, this is what, this kind of advertising that existed. I mean, yeah, back in the 20s, you could have that good old old time plantation flavor. <laughs> um, but even into the 1950s, you had ads like the one on the, on the bottom left, um, Happy Days is Here. And, of course, then you have uh, this moving out of the consumer world into uh, the art of, cinema with, with uh, Gone with the Wind and other, other films. Um, so soon after his time in Egypt, I mean, this was a time of, of great tumult in the United States. And you can see clearly this reference to the Vietnam War, a war in which uh, black soldiers, you know, far outnumbered white soldiers in, in 
in, in terms of their percentage of the American population. Um, and Colescott did many paintings in which he's saying, this is what makes America work. This is, this is, this is, these are the essential ingredients of American culture. It's uh, a flag. You have the red, white, and blue here. In other paintings, you actually see the flag. And it's um, a curvy blonde woman, white blonde woman. And um, just to emphasize, then you have apple pie and um, with one slice of it between her legs. Um, now, Colescott wasn't alone in, in, in dissecting culture at that time. He, this is one of the artists that we know that he was influenced by, Tom Wesselman, you know, and other pop artists who were, um, you know, making images of how vapid uh, American white culture was, you know, in, in these images. Um, the woman has no face, she just has orifices and bold colors, a lot of red, white, and blue. It's almost as though she's drawing her back with a flag there in that left one. And then he was influenced um, by R. Crumb, Robert Crumb, the uh, graphic novel artist, uh, comic artist, who really had this incredible gumption to make images that were so hot, so sexualized. And I'm, I'm, I'm just showing you the more mild ones um, that I think helped give give Colescott a license to feel, well, he can he can say what he wants to say because Crumb is doing that as well. Of course, eventually Crumb moved to Switzerland, I think, and it's getting hot over here. Um, Colescott continues to critique American culture and American consumerism. I've never understood, number one, it's fascinating to me as, as an honorary Italian and someone who likes to cook pasta and make pasta, that, that people would buy canned spaghetti and meatball. And why was the brand called Franco-American? At least that's what I, I remember. Like, is it French-American pasta? I don't think the French would like to own that either. But anyway, um, so Cole Scott says, well, hey, we have culture too. We have Afro-American spaghetti. <laughs> it's just wonderful. This, I personally, I think is the hardest painting to look at. I find it the hardest to look at by Cole Scott because it's, it's, you know, th there's no place in the image where your eyes can escape this harsh, harsh image of racist visual tropes about black Americans. Um, at the same time, he is talking about class, about poverty, I mean, Colescott's work is emphatically about power, about class, and about gender, certainly about race, and emphatically about sex. Um, and it's 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 quite a dead ringer for you know for Van Gogh's original here. And then um, another amazing tour de force of his is this work. And he's great at his, his titles for his work. He says, I get a thrill too when I seize the coup. <laughs> and, and he also prints, takes the name, the, the title on the bottom there. And really, it's, it's so faithful to the Kooning's uh, original. It's just the Kooning left out Aunt Jemima's head, you know. 1950-52 that he, that he made that painting. So I think you can see now, while for the most part, no major museum was interested in acquiring Colescott's work. They just ignored it, totally ignored it. It's only now, in fact, up until last year, none of his paintings had even come close to being sold for a million dollars, which is commonplace in today's art world. However, in 2021, end of 21, I think uh, late in 2021, the, the, the new, I don't think it's open yet, the George Lucas Museum that's gonna open outside the Bay Area in San Francisco, they purchased the uh, George Washington Park across in the Delaware for 15.3 million. So big, that's a big statement to make, big game changer for Colescott's estate. Um, oh, here's another just kind of overwhelming image. Um, and I think most everybody in the room 
knows who Bill Robinson was, um, who was this kind of genial, you know, stereotypical caricature of a black man in so many films. And I, I believe he'd also often would be on the screen with Shirley Temple, who was, you know, the whitest white little girl who ever existed. Uh, and then bizarrely, you know, when she gets married a lot later in her life, her new, her last name became black. And I think Colescott just came across this fact and said, holy shit, I can do this. I can, I, Shirley Temple Black and Bill Robinson White. And, you know, he really doesn't change much about their faces or their expressions. He just changes the pigments. Makes you think. And again, technicolor, real technicolor. Now, this image is, is a little different from the others. I mean, at the top, you know, I had to really look up on Wikipedia about Amos and Andy. I kind of had a vague idea, but I, I didn't really know the facts that Amos and Andy were these two white entertainers who for decades did this slapstick radio show in which they are caricaturing black people, you know, in the most racist ways. And most Americans thought that they were listening to two black men. And later it became a television show in which they hired black actors, but they had to mimic this horrific voices that these two white guys had, had developed. So here we see Cole Scott showing um, these entertainers up there and it's coming out of the radio. And interestingly, um, coming out of the radio that they're listening to is this finger that's a uh, hand that's, it's, it seems to be a cigar smoking a lot of pistol um, pointed at this couple. Um, and that's kind of, that's all threatening and kind of horrible. But on the other hand, the image of this little boy and the woman, which I figure we have to guess it's the mother, that this is kind of a cozy, you know, lovely little domestic scene. On the other hand, you know, Cole Scott never leaves well enough alone so that the ice cream, and I don't think ice cream came in those colors in 1982. I think that was later, like post Baskin Robbins or something. Um, but not only is the ice cream these kind of lured orange, oranges and, and, and magenta reds, but also he shows some of it on the woman's breast. And, you know, I think that is Cole Scott telling us, well, there's always sex going on. And, and like, is this his feeling about a mother that, that he wants to be able to nurse at her breast, which he's painted. Um, and again, in, in vivid colors and, but all is well, because you can see the stars are out in the night sky up to, outside the window. Um, and, and, it is, and this is one of his self portraits in which, at least in this pose, he's saying, hey, I've got this all together. You know, I'm a good artist, I'm collecting art. I've got this white wife, one of his white wives, and um, everything is cool. He's, he's all set. Um, however, this is the rare image that, that sends that message, if indeed this is what the message is. Um, by the way, I'm happy at any time to be interrupted by anybody who has another thought. Um, but there are other images which give us insight into how much pain he was going through, somewhat of this identity crisis. It's not as though he just declared himself to be black and then he didn't have to have any worries in life. Um, and this is titled very straightforward, Passing, which I think speaks for itself. And in this um, later image on, on paper, uh, he can't sleep and he seems to be uh, besieged by the various women or symbolizing various women in his life. Um, and the context or the, the rest of the dream seems all, uh, all to be, he's in great danger. You know, he's surrounded by daggers that are already have their tips blooded. Uh, we see a pistol with smoke puffing out of it as, as, a, as he's being shot. Um, so his sleep was not very restful. There's a few paintings, curiously, in which we see Cole Scott either sitting on piles of rocks or surrounded by rocks. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what to make of that. Um, 
And there isn't usually, there isn't, aren't many which reference religion, but in this we see this constellation that forms the cross in the sky. Um, and I'm not aware, I've read up a little bit on St. Anthony, but I'm, I'm really not knowing where the temptation is, but the temptation that he's talking about are these different women and, but are they real? Because the woman on the right seems to be just an apparition coming out of this uh, campfire there. But, you know, Cole Scott, I, I, what I love about him is his transparency. He is honest. You know, he's a man seized by lust and, and he loves it. It'll be interesting when this big biography comes out to, to see what is, you know, what, what's been discovered about his life in an intimate sense. Um, this one, are you sure? Francis Father's Day. And um, I have to think this is him because he had four children that that this is his concern, his worry about having each time he had a baby, like, what color is that baby going to be? You know, what if, you know, because he has three wives who become, who, who give birth to his four children. And based on this image, he must have been just sweating it out to see, oh, shit, you know, because it's a secret to everyone. No one knows for his first 40 years that he is passing for white and the baby could give it all away. Another image kind of in which shows his life and his uh, love and lust for women, but the dangers, you know, in this woman confronting him with a Saturday night special. Um, and, you know, Cole Scott gets serious, but he reminds us that you have to laugh too. They said, I've seen her on TV. Um, this is a kind of unusual uh, painting and just two heads. Um, the French in Louisiana, which is pretty fantastic because, uh, you know, he, his family came from Louisiana and, and he's, painted here a man who kind of has certain kind of characteristics, stereotypical look of Frenchmen, seems to have a beret on, but also I think it's about the French kiss that's going on here. And you have to think back that just the idea of an interracial kiss was remarkable for much of his life. Um, this in 1968 was the first from what I understand, the first ever interracial kiss on any in any movie or TV show, 1968, and people were amazed. Captain Kirk is kissing Lieutenant Uhura, you know. Um, and put that together with the fact that just the year before, with that Supreme Court decision, is when it ceased being against the law to marry someone of a different uh, race. This is 50 years ago. This is a later picture of Cole Scott. But I think, you know, a lot of his paintings depict uh, not only the pain that he sees in uh, black history in this country, but, but his own uncomfortableness and pain. Um, you know, he's a man divided, a, a white and a black man simultaneously. Um, and, uh, you know, suffering, being martyred as St. Sebastian was, and then um, showing us how dangerous it is for a couple who are seen as, quote, you know, interracial couple um, are yoked together and have nooses around their neck, not to mention the skulls, the, the skulls and skeletons come up in, in quite a number of his works. Cole Scott continues to draw on kind of um, really memes that are, are the great iconic Western works of art, like the theme of women bathing has been a, a constant one in Western art. Um, this one makes reference also to another judgment, to the judgment of Paris, which, you know, the, the Greek myth of um, choose, choosing which the most desirable woman was. 
Um, Cole Scott depicts himself, you know, now he's got white hair and a white beard. And um, there's, there's no erection in this one. He, he seems to be asleep, um, maybe dreaming of these four different women. Um, but, you know, he had plenty of company earlier. I mean, there's this idea, I've, I've seen writings saying, well, but Cezanne was just interested in how the light created different planes on these women. Yeah, well, that's probably true, but Cezanne was finding a lot of other things of interest in these bathers and, you know, bathing, what you could kind of get away with for, you know, painting these nude women because they're bathing, it's like a natural thing. Of course, Gauguin, there's one, he, he did a painting of women bathing in France, but they're all covered up because it's France. So that's why he had to go to Tahiti so he could really get, get the pictures he wanted. So here we come back to the image that we saw part of in the very beginning. Um, and I think, you know, here we really see Cole Scott deliberating like, huh, what do I do now? Who am I? Why am I here? And, you know, of, of course, he's, he's paying tribute to uh, Matisse's iconic work. Um, he, his titles are often, you know, important statements. He's saying, it's the beholder. It's, this is what I see. This is what I value. Um, you, often, you often see these checkerboard uh, pieces of apparel that perhaps represent like the checkerboard flag at a, at a race, like completing the race and, and winning. Uh, I think he, he likes to see himself winning, although he's insecure and, and worried about so many things. I'm, I think I meant to say earlier that, you know, when he was a boy growing up in Oakland, California, um, that he really had a lot of trauma from that experience because number one, um, he saw how people with darker skin were being treated and he knew that he had this kind of bizarre pass um, because his mother said, you are going to pass. Uh, and then there was tremendous tension between his parents, again, who were identified by all around them as being different races. And his father was very frustrated uh, because he couldn't pursue the work he wanted to do. And, you know, I think he carried that trauma with him uh, for his whole lifetime. Um, I think this painting, uh, again, is going back to, although it's called Knowledge of the Past is the Key to the Future, the original. He's in a whole series of paintings called Knowledge of the Past is Key to the Future, the original. By the original, I think he means his original past. Again, you see these pile of rocks. And here, the rocks are everywhere. Um, we see, as we often do, women of, of different skin color, all of them alluring, um, all of them seeming to be interested in him. Um, there's, again, the, then there's a, a foot on this kind of day glow green heel on the top right. And there's the candle. Um, so really, I feel like I'm left, we're left with the title, hard time. I mean, hard time can mean doing time in, in prison. That's a hard time. Uh, and he does look in prison like, like he's, he can't get out from under these rocks that, that have been laid on this trauma that was original for him. And he, um, I think he delights in, in sometimes, often, uh, he delights in his kind of uh, bad boy behavior, which certainly was for the time of having kind of hot and cold running women throughout his life all the time. Um, and the, the constellation this time is not a cross, but it would seem to be uh, someone's cock in someone's mouth out there floating in the sky. Um, and then iconic symbols of American culture, like a cheeseburger up there and deck of cards. I love this painting because maybe in this one, um, Cole Scott has reached a point where he says, I'm God, I am fucking God. You know, he's, he's got the colors and he's gonna create 
the world as it should be. And here's his, a legend dimly told, it's the story of the Garden of Eden uh, with a different Adam and Eve than we usually see depicted. Notice that the apple has been chewed, which the, the discarded apple core is sitting there on, on the path. Um, this again is appropriation, a very common, common image seen in, uh, in Western art of the three graces. And um, in a moment, I'm gonna, after this slide, I'm gonna transition to talking about my family and how I relate to Colescott. Um, but this is, this is a, a key quotation, I think, from Colescott. If you decide to laugh, don't forget the humor is the bait. And once you're bitten, you may have to do some serious chewing. So, you know, he's always been conscious of the fact that he is, you know, putting the bait out there, putting something to tempt us and, and, and dare and he dares us to look at it. And a lot of people didn't want to look at it. And it's only now that I think the art world is beginning to reckon with Colescott. It's fascinating because, you know, his satire is bitingly hard. Um, but you'd think would, you know, it's been years, decades in which we see satire in, in films. We see certain satire in, in music, in entertainment. Um, but somehow uh, the art world has been a lot slower to accept, you know, really hardcore satire. And in this one, you know, this is, I love this slide because um, I think in this one, Cole Scott sees him as something, he's passed away, um, no pun intended there, um, but he has made his mark and, and certainly uh, Cole Scott has made his mark. Now, transitioning here a minute, you know, this is the, the map that says a lot about his journey, where he came from. Um, for my family, uh, there are various maps, but this is a, a key map because my father was born in Jerusalem uh, five years before Colescott was born. Colescott was born in 1925. My father was born in 1920. Colescott died in 2009. My father died in 2002. Um, my great, 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 great grandfather, um, Abraham Shlomo Solomon, sort of Solomon, together with his wife and their first two children, walked from Kedanya, Lithuania, to Constantinople, that is to say, so walked from there to there. And after a pause there, they found a boat and got on a boat and made it to Israel in the year 1811. Um, and one can only imagine the, the traumas that they endured to, to successfully uh, make that trip. Um, this is a photograph uh, made in 1901. And um, the uh, boy here holding his side, that's my father's father, my grandfather uh, at, at, at five years old. Oh, and, and uh, I should say that to his left is his brother, sister, there were more later, and then his mother and his father, who was a rabbi, part of a long line of rabbis, uh, and they were... Um, giving out food to the people who were poorer than they were. I mean, they were plenty poor, but they were feeding others. Um, two generations later, this Solomon became very famous because of his work in uh, establishing the first Hebrew language newspaper in the 1870s. The, my five-year-old, the five-year-old boy, who was my grandfather, this is him. Uh, when he was pressed into the army uh, by the Ottomans and they sent him to, uh, to Europe to fight for Germany. He wasn't having any of that. When he got to Germany, they gave him a weapon. He shot himself in the leg. He was in a field hospital and he escaped and went back to Jerusalem and then married my Bubby and basically said, I'm out of here. You know, it was just chaos. And he went to the States and his, his, um, wife and my father and, bro and uncle came with. And this is jumping ahead. This was, it was the classic immigrant story. Now this picture all is well. Uh, my mother on the, on the left in the cellar hat is actually pregnant with me when this picture was taken. And my father is behind her with the, 
talk about it, Ty and his father in the blue suit and his wife there and other children and um, spouses. Um, but it was it was a hard time. I mean, it was it, this was after the depression. You know, this would have been in the early 50s. Um, but, you know, I know that my and this is a picture that uh, very rare picture of my father, I guess, somewhere in his teens. Um, and he, um, you know, I think it was very traumatic. And he arrives as a three year old, has grown up during the Depression. They were very poor, like hungry poor. Um, and um, there were always fights between his parents who had had an arranged marriage. Um, his father, my grandfather, was a rabbi and a shachet, someone who would co do kosher slaughtering. And he began forming a union which the entire Jewish establishment fought back at, you know, said, hey, you're going to make it, you're going to make it bad for us Jews if you, if, if you do this. But he said, I'm, I'm going to do it anyway. Um, and, you know, my father would, um, <clears throat> every day he'd take a couple trolleys and a long walk to the public school. And then he would have to make a longer journey to go to the Shiva because he would have to study Talmud and Torah afterwards every day. And he was always getting um, beaten up. You know, he was an easy mark. He had a skull cap, a kippah, a yarmulke on his head. Um, and he was, you know, he was an immigrant. I mean, he was having to learn English in addition to everything else. And he had to make money to help support the family. Um, he actually got a scholarship, a citywide scholarship that enabled him to, to go to, to uh, Temple University. And he majored in art. And in the same time of his life, he then joins the army. Uh, goes to Europe, and um, both men, Colstadt and my father, used the GI Bill to get their graduate uh, graduate degrees. Uh, you know, both of them were carrying the trauma around. Both of them were questioning, you know, who are they? Uh, you know, what what am what am I going to make out of my life? Um, this is my dad in his twenties uh, when he was working as a counselor at a camp in in, the, in Virginia. This is him um, after. The war ended, but working for the American military government in in, in Austria, um, there's no question that that someone at some point retouched this picture to put this pipe in his mouth. He was definitely I can tell from the picture this is this is a pipe he had later in life. But anyway, this is this is the man, um, and he you know he had his adventures. He had his women. He had really adventurous life, and I know that because. To some extent, he told me, to some extent, my mother acknowledged it because this happened before she met. Uh, but, you know, it was wartime. Uh, he fell in love with a, a Catholic Austrian teenager uh, who was a refugee. And uh, they had this, you know, kind of torrid romance. I know from the letters that, that they sent each other. And I know because I found this woman named Anna when she was in her mid-70s. And... Um, went to visit her and spent two nights talking with her, drinking bottles of wine. And it was clear to me, you know, my father wouldn't marry her because if he did, he would never have seen his father again. You know, that would have been, that would have been it. Uh, and it was clear to me from meeting this woman, Anna, that, that she, he was her big love of her life all those, all those decades before. But he meets my mother and they're both uh, very politically involved. Um, and this is them on their honeymoon uh, up in uh, Provincetown, uh, Cape Cod. Uh, he was then 29 and she was uh, 21. But she came from a very different background, Jewish, but her father, also an immigrant, but had become a huge American success story in the construction trades where Jews really had a hard time. I mean, I know from hearing from various, from my mother and my aunts that, um, you know, he was trying to make it in this business where Jews had not been permitted. And, um, but he succeeded and his partners would uh, take him to a, a golf club that didn't allow Jews. And they would just put their arm around my grandpa Lou and they say, it's okay, Lou, you're a white Jew. Um, and I think he was always afraid to be uncovered as being a Jewish man in, in this trade. Um, and well, let me just go on a little further. I know I'm running close on time here. Uh, my father begins his, his uh, career.
career as an art educator in a high school in New Jersey. Uh, I'm born and someone stuck a camera in my hand at a very young age, apparently. Um, this is a portrait I took of my family when I was 10. Um, and like Colescott, you know, I've always loved women. This, this was my first girlfriend, um, Janet, who's still a very close friend of mine. She sent me birthday greetings this morning. Uh, we're age seven here. <laughs> it was quite a romance. Um, and then, but what really confused me uh, in terms of my religious identity was that, you know, my father's family came from this ultra severely orthodox uh, background. You know, that's the man who you saw as a five-year-old and then in the uniform of the, of the Germans and then the patriarch of his family. And here he is at the Passover table and with my cousin coming to, around to wash hands. Uh, and I love that world. On the other hand, when I went out in public on the rare occasion with, with my Zeta, I was embarrassed because he spoke this poor English and you know, heavily Yiddishized accent, and he just seemed so foreign. You know, whereas my, my other grandfather was, um, you know, it seemed like an American. And I just didn't know what to make of it all. I mean, I love the fact that, um, we had these amazing holidays together with family. Um, there's my grandfather and his wife, and, and um, the woman on the right is my father's uh, sister. Um, but it was confusing, and my parents were very political, as I said. They were very involved in the um, civil rights movement of the 19, late, late 40s into the 50s and 60s. And we lived on a street where there was only one other Jewish family. and my parents would, would, we would get Christmas presents from my parents and we, there would be Christmas dinners with, with some of her cousin, her, her family and with people on the street. And I was just appalled. I mean, I just, it was so confusing. Um, and it's taken me really my whole lifetime to kind of own my Jewish identity in ways that are comfortable for me. Um, but, you know, I think uh, I'm grateful for my parents um, finding their way. And always, it's always a difficult time, certainly in those years. Um, as it happens, this is really the second presentation I made at KIA, and in both of them, I've told a very personal story. Uh, as it happens in 2019, just about almost this day, or first this week of December 2019, I came and gave this talk getting the picture now that I cut all my hair off. Um, I gave this talk about Paul Robeson because um, he was a big hero to my parents. They had met him in the course of their political activities. And um, they named me Paul Robert because of Paul Robeson, which even that was probably kind of, they were kind of threading the needle because when my father got that job in the high school, he knew that he could not let anybody know about his political affiliations. Uh, he'd be too left and too Jewish, I think, for the crowd. Um, anyway, there's always more to say, but I'll just leave you with the fact that Colescott, too, admired uh, Paul Robeson. Um, this is a poor reproduction, but of an extraordinary work of his uh, called, again, Knowledge of the Past is Key to the Future, Heroes. And here, Colescott paints his Mount Rushmore. And on his Mount Rushmore is Paul Robeson, Dumas, uh, the, the French author, and again, George Washington Carver. And, and again, a panoply of the kinds of characters uh, who represent American culture through Colescott's eyes. And notice, it's, it's hard to make out, but in this corner here, uh, I believe that represents Colescott. We see his eyes, he's got this cap on, as though he's about to jump on a ship, and he's masked. He's got a black mask covering his face. Thanks, everybody. If, if we have time, I'm delighted to, to take um, to take any questions you might have. If you don't have questions, then you all have to send me an essay. Um, 
500 words by tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> Rahima. Uh -huh. um, I, you know, one of the things that I, I kind of thought about, and it's been an area of research for me, even it's just thinking about the ways in which, um, you know, we're socialized, right? And how you learn to either love or hate yourself. Mm -hmm. And when I think about something like Amos and Andy, I think of that in mind, you know, like just thinking about like something so innocent, right? Like as listening to a radio program or watching a, a television program and how it can really inform um, a child, you know, inform people. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I was, I was when you said that, I, I just kind of wanted to throw that out there because even with the, like, you, you were like that or that orange ice cream. I was like, I had orange ice cream. My grandmother made it. It was Sherbert. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of just thought of it as like this idea of like how like he, they're in this nurturing environment, but then there's this, this insidious thing happening mm. that they're not even aware of. You yeah, know? yeah. I think that that for me is like something that I see a like when I look at um, Cole Scott's paintings. I think a lot of that is underlying that sort of insidiousness. Yeah, you know? that's the word. Yeah. There's, there's so much through much of his work, and I love the contrast in this piece in particular with Heroes, where in the majority of American education and the American experience up through 1986, which was the first year that we actually got Black History Month in schools, mm. none of these men were known to right. the majority of the American public as the images of Black excellence. Yet, at that time, Uncle Ben and Aunt Jemima and Sam Bubba and the Tar Baby were all widely known, and Amos and Andy were all widely known, even though they were all creations of white narrative around the standardized image of blackness in America. Absolutely. It's, it's work to, to push our perspectives about those things. Yeah. 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 Like yeah, who was also an artist, but you know, didn't have a notable career. Um, that's about as much as I've been able to find out. His name was Warrington, Warrington Colescott. Well, not really, not in the art world, no. This is how artists traditionally have learned. I mean, going back to, you know, if you wanted to sculpt in, in Florence, you would be fortunate to uh, be in the atelier of, of Michelangelo. Um, if you're going to learn to paint, then you'd be in the school of Raphael. In fact, to this day, you know, art historians argue sometimes about whether, is that really a Raphael or was it someone in, who was studying there? Um, and, you know, if you look through, um, you know, Cezanne was picking up on cues left for him, uh, and then Picasso, uh, as bases his, you know, history on Cezanne and others. Um, this is really, um, an important way that, that artists learn. And even to this day, I mean, I happen this semester to be teaching drawing, which is not what I usually do here. Um, and um, it's important for students to learn from what's been done. Uh, and then they can find their own path. But I think the lesson is the idea of art being, any work of art being unique and original. The word original is, is tricky because really all artists, all of us who are creative are standing on the shoulders of other Thanks, everyone. I love being here.